But we are in week three of a series, and um, just to be honest, we've gotten so much feedback, positive feedback from the last two weeks as we tackle this word shame, uh, because I I think part of the reason why is it's something we're all dealing with. Every single one of us here in this church building uh, deals with shame. And even as we've been uh, preaching and teaching on shame, how many of you have felt shame in one way or another? Anybody felt that? You're like, oh my gosh, I just, we just learned about this and yet I'm feeling it. Come on, it, it, it attacks us. It's, it's a battle. And if you missed the first two weeks, here's the synopsis. Shame never comes from Jesus. Boom. Shame is, he is not the author of shame. Uh, the enemy is, the devil is. And so the reality is we talked about shame for what we've done, the things that we've done, the mistakes we've made in week one. And then um, last week, uh, we, we continued uh, in the series, and then today we're talking about shame um, for who we are. Last week we talked about temptation. This week we're talking about shame for who we are. So shame for what we've done, shame for the things we want to do, and then ultimately shame for your identity, for the parts that make up who you are. And this uh, sermon, if I'm being really honest, I, I've waded into carefully. And the reason why is because I believe there is an attack on the identity of humans. And specifically, uh, Christ followers, people who say, hey, I'm going to serve Jesus. There is an attack on our identity, which is supposed to be found in Christ. Uh, This phrase, in Christ, is actually used in Scripture 55 times. It is a consistent way to help us understand where our identity needs to be grounded. And so before we actually preach, before I actually preach this sermon, I want to kind of establish a few things here first. We're going to open up to the Word of God. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 17, to see kind of some aspects of what it looks like to be in Christ. And the author here, Paul, is writing to the church in Corinth, and he said this, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. I love this distinction. He, he, you know, he, he's actually saying, Hey, the way that I used to view the world, the way that I used to view myself, and the way that I used to view others has shifted since Jesus. So he's talking about since Jesus, we used to, we've stopped evaluating people from this point of view. I'm going to be honest, hopefully none of us have wrapped our identity in human points of view. And that we have not allowed people to speak into us who see us from a human point of view. And what's important is that we are in Christ. Because at one time, we thought of Christ merely from this human point of view. And so we saw our identity as human. We saw who we are as human. But how differently we know him now. How differently we know him. Our entire framework of thinking has changed since Jesus. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ, or another translation said, or is in Christ, has become a new person. Another translation would say a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Really simply put, this verse helps us to understand that if you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you repent from your sins, you turn from what was, you move into what is, you are a completely new creation. You need to see the world through a different lens. You need an entire new framework of thinking. In your old life, is supposed to be gone, and you're supposed to begin a new life. Now, where we get a lot of identity crises is when we don't actually leave the old life to begin the new one. When we live somewhere in the middle, or where we live from this human point of view, where we don't actually put to death this human point of view. But the reality is you are a new creation, and with it you comes a new identity. There's this famous story of this man who was, in 2004, he was found naked and wounded behind a Burger King. When he woke and was tended to in the hospital, he had such severe amnesia, he couldn't remember anything about his life. Nothing. Like, blank slate. Couldn't tell his name. Couldn't remember how he got there. Didn't remember how he ended up naked. Like, why are you naked, dude? Like, <laughs> what, what was the situation? Like, that's a bad day. Why are you behind a Burger King? What was the scenario? I mean, he knew nothing. And so obviously what they do is then the police begin investigations. They're going to take fingerprints and try to figure out who this guy is. 
Police couldn't do anything, and then they hired private investigators, still couldn't find out who this guy is. So Dr. Phil gets involved, of course. And if Dr. Phil can't solve it, I don't know who can. You know what I mean? And so Dr. Phil, and even Dr. Phil, puts him on national television. Nobody knows who this guy is. He's got no identity. He has no clue, no social security number, no ability to get a job, no ability to even be human. Right? And in that moment, think about that for a second. Can you imagine the value loss you would feel if your whole identity was wiped? Can, can you imagine the loss of experiences and memories and all of those things? It would feel astronomical. But let me ask a question, church. Did that man's value change with the forgetfulness of his identity? Did his value shift? Did his value change? Was he just as valuable or was he less valuable? And see, it poses this question of when we are start as a new creation and the old has gone, does that make us more valuable, less valuable, equally as valuable? How do we understand value? In fact, I would argue you cannot have an identity conversation without understanding value. So many people are in a crisis of identity because they have wrongly valued themselves and they have shame for who they are or who they are not. You see, value is an interesting question, but what what creates value for anything? So let's take it away from the human conversation. What decides value? Ultimately, what people are willing to pay for it, right? What people are willing to pay for it. Recently, uh, Renee and I we brought our kids over to our brother-in-law's, and he was pulling out some stuff from their childhood, some old-school Beanie Babies, right? And, and, and he also bought, brought out this book, this giant book of all of Renee's Pokemon cards. And uh, don't worry, we prayed over those Pokemon cards. We cast out all the demons that are in them. Don't you worry, okay? They're cleansed. They are whole. If you want to know anything different about her childhood than mine, my Pokemon cards were in the trash like a good Christian boy, okay? And uh, she saved hers. Praise God, because now I start looking at these and I go, whoa, hold on. What are these worth, right? And I do a quick search because I actually find in this the golden, like the, the, the ultimate Charizard card in this. Like the original, it's the holy grail of Pokemon cards, right? And, it's the, and I go, oh my gosh, I do a quick search and it says, these are selling for $150,000. And I mean, you know, I go, oh my gosh, we're going to pay down our mortgage. This is awesome. And I get so excited, Right? I get like goosebumps. And I'm like, what are all of these worth? You've got hundreds of original hologram cards. But then you start to do a deeper dive, right? You want to think it's $150,000, but then they go, yeah, but does it have the first edition stamp on it? Yeah, but, but actually, does there, is there any nicks? And I go, oh, Renee, you nicked it. Oh, seven-year-old Renee was not careful enough with this. And I start breaking it down, and then you find out there's, like, one that has a shadow, and then the one that's worth more doesn't have this shadow behind his tail. And there's all of these qualifications, and rather than $150,000, this one's worth, like, hundred and fifty, dollars right? And I'm like, how about just for nostalgia, we just hold on to it. We're just going to keep the Charizard card. But the reality is the value is determined by what people are willing to pay for it because they want the more rare version. So they're going to pay a higher price for the one that was a misprint or a first edition or all the different details and no creases and no, no nicks and, and no damage. And so naturally, we as humans, why would we not associate value to things like that? Well, I'm damaged. I'm nicked. I'm not, I'm not really that valuable. I'm not really that special. I'm not, I'm not really capable of that much. I haven't really accomplished that much. So, of course, I'm going to devalue myself. But the reality is you don't set your price. You don't set your value. And you don't set your worth. The only person who determines those things is your heavenly father. And he sent his one and only son to die on the cross. And you've already been paid for. Your price has already been set. And your value is high. You are valuable. You matter. You are of high value. You cannot decrease that value. It's already been paid. It was paid before you were damaged. It was paid before you made that mistake. It was paid before you put the shame on. Your value was already set before you were born. Because for God so loved the, that he gave his one and only son. You were included in the ultimate price, the ultimate sacrifice. So we cannot have a conversation about identity if you do not first understand your value. 
And it's at the understanding of that value that now we can start to approach a conversation of how we need to view ourselves, how we can rid ourselves of some shame that we've attached to our lives. And there's actually this amazing illustration that's really simple but is helpful. And again, it's another writing of Paul, and he was writing to a son in the faith, Timothy. And he says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 19, but God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his. Another really important thing, are you, do you belong to God? Have you made him Lord of your life? Well, if that took place, when you were made into a new creation, there's a new foundation stone. You are now in Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone. And actually what they would do is they would inscribe on cornerstones often who set the cornerstone, maybe the date, the name of the building. They would inscribe, this was the cornerstone. And here Paul's illustrating this fact by saying that the cornerstone has this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his. You are inscribed on that cornerstone. You have a strong foundation. And all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. In verse 20, a wealthy home, in a wealthy home, some utensils or vessels, another translation says, are made of gold and silver, valuable items. And some are made of wood and clay. They're going to break down. They're going right, to they, they, mold. They're going to rust. They're going to rot away. The expensive utensils are set aside. They're used for special occasions. And the cheap ones are for everyday use. How many of you guys grew up in a household with China? Come on, the good China in the hutch, right? Like, you know this, right? I never got to eat on my China. I was not trusted with it. I took out way too many plates in my day to ever be trusted with the good utensils, the good plates, the good China, right? Because that's set aside for when company comes. That's set aside for when adults are going to eat, not seven-year-old Sam Grasso, right? And so so it's, it's set aside for special use when you want someone to feel special and feel valued and comes into your house and you want to show that off. You say, hey, I'm going to use the good stuff here. The cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you'll be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you'll be ready for the master to use you for every good work. He's actually saying, hey, if you would build your life on the cornerstone and be founded in Christ. And then if you would work and do the effort to keep yourself pure, did you know that you have the availability to not be the wood or the clay, but to actually be the gold and the silver? You actually have the availability for special use. This verse does not denote talent ability. This, this verse does not say if, you're, if you look this way or you look this way. This verse does not talk about your background or your culture or your skin color. It says, hey, you can be used for special use. You are special. You can be used in that way. If you would make him, if you would find your identity in Christ, oh, the things I've got for you. Oh, the plans I have for you. Oh, what I would do. But when you don't value yourself and you decide that you're wood and clay, that you're to be used and abused and you're not that valuable, your identity will always be that of the thing that gets used and abused. You're not going to have a standard. You're not going to set yourself up. See, even purity, even that idea of keeping yourself pure and keeping things away, one of the greatest motivators of not allowing sin into your life, life, not listening to the temptation we talked about last week, is to say, hey, I don't want anything to devalue me. When that comes into my life, that's, a, that's devaluing me. Uh, God's made me for better. I've got a higher standard. I believe for more in my life. I'm not going to settle for less. I want more. And that is settling for less. I don't think like the world. I don't think as a human. I've, I've been, got the mind of Christ. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I'm, I've got better. I'm worth more. I, have, I am of higher value. So as we dive into this conversation, it's really important, one, for you to understand that you're valuable. But two, that you understand you're only truly valuable when you allow yourself to be used the way you were created. So this is one of the tensions. Your value decreases when you try to determine the use. Do you actually believe that God created you intentionally and his plan is the best plan? His use is the best use. See, if you would agree on this idea that God made you in his image, that he knits you together in your mother's wombs, that, that he's got something for you. If you could begin 
to understand this, Jeremiah 18, the prophet had this amazing experience where God actually tells him to go down to the potter's house and actually watch the potter as he molds the clay. And he uses it as this example. Is it the clay's job to tell the potter what to make it into? Is it the clay's job to tell the potter what his use is? Ultimately, is it the clay's job to tell the potter what his identity is? And what is proper and right in the way to be created? No, the reality is the clay is being shaped by that potter. But this is a tough tension for us. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 puts it really, really blunt. And this is where I'm going to lose some of you. Or, if you'd be willing, I hope you'd stick with me. Because this verse is intense. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Now, you've heard that part a lot. Oh, we like this one, especially the fitness world. If you're in the fitness world, you love this verse, right? Your body's a temple. Come on, get your reps in today. You got to keep it. Come on. And, and right, it's always used for physical fitness. It's used in that realm. And it's true. Why would Paul illustrate our body as a temple? Because he understood that actually even though this part of our body is temporary, it does matter on this side of eternity. How we handle our body matters because the Holy Spirit's inside of it. And so he would use the illustration of a temple because their standard of, of temple cleanliness, of temple practices, was very, very high in antiquity. And not just with the Jews. You could argue even more with the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, it was like their gods were taken care of, right? He used an illustration that they would have connected with. Your body is a temple. Your flesh matters. This matters. What you do with this matters. But you are not your own. This is where it gets hard. This is where we lose people. You are not your own. Why? Because you were bought with a price. You were bought with the price. You were bought with the highest price. And in fact, the price that was paid for you is where you get such, your, such a high value from. That price dictates a higher value than you could ever earn yourself. You could never gain that amount of value within yourself. But Jesus said, hey, I'm going to buy you at that price. So you are not your own. So as you approach, who am I? The big question, who am I? Who am You ever asked, who am I? Who am I really? As you approach that question, you cannot do it unless you are found in Christ and understand that you are in Christ because he paid a price which gives you value and that you are more valuable and you are set aside for a more special use if you do not try to determine the use and you trust the creator and say, I'm not my own. I belong to you and I want to follow you. I want to serve you. And if you call me to the Middle East, I'm going to go to the Middle East. It might take a couple years for me to get there, but I'm going to go and I'm going to work that through. Why? Because at the end of the day, my life is not my own. My life is not my own. I laid that down. But too often we don't ever talk about this as it pertains to salvation. And so we say, hey, you're a new creation. And they're like, how? By not thinking that your life is your own. By saying, hey, I'm actually going to lay down my plans and say, God, what are your plans? I'm going to lay down the use that I decided for my body and for my life. And I'm going to say, God, how would you have me use my body and my life? And say, I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to root this in Christ. And it's in Christ that I'll understand this. I was bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And so I look in detail in Scripture, what are the ways in which to use my body that will glorify God? What is the way in which to use my life in a way that glorifies God? So this verse gives us a framework for us to continue in the message. It breaks down two parts. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. So the reality is we are a body, we have the flesh, but we are also a soul which connects with the spirit. There is these two pieces to us. And sometimes when we talk about identity in church, sometimes in church we can get almost too far on one side or the other where maybe it's very, very like only the inside matters, right? You don't need to take care of yourself. You can fall apart. It doesn't matter the work you do. It doesn't matter your contribution to the world. It doesn't matter if your house is falling apart. It doesn't matter if you're stewarding the things that God has given you. None of that matters as long as you feel good about who you are on the inside. And then the other side is, I'm going to make everything look perfect. I'm going to have a perfect life, perfect wife, perfect kids, perfect house, perfect everything. And on the inside, it's just a black hole of desperation. The reality is the scriptures continually talk about both. Because on this side of heaven, we got to value both. And, 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 and there is the, the, the reality of what we do in the flesh that really, really matters. And then there is the reality of who we are in the spirit that really, really matters. They both matter and they work in tandem with each other. And so if you try to cut one out and only focus on one, you're probably going to get off balance. 
and you're going to have a bit of an identity crisis. But we have to realize, hey, there's two pieces to who I am. So there is both a who I am and a what I do within the identity conversation founded in Christ. So let's begin with uh, the inside. Let's begin with who we are because God works from the inside out, not the outside in. That may sound like a catchy little phrase that I say a lot, but can we realize the importance of it? He's working from the inside out. So now what that did is it helped me understand the place that my flesh has and it helped me understand the place that my, the spirit has. I begin with what God's doing on the inside and then it moves its way to the outside. So we're going to start with who we are in Christ, who we are in Christ. And one of the pieces that I think maybe you could relate with, how many of you, when you accepted Jesus and you are now a new creation, you're like, then why did the personality traits that I don't like about myself, why did they not just disappear? Anybody ever had this feeling? You're like, yeah, but like, couldn't I have like not had that anymore? Couldn't I like not be obnoxious in that way? Or couldn't you have just shifted this? Couldn't you have just done this for free? But the reality is, I firmly believe there is no way there is such a diversity of personality on accident. Notice that Jesus did not demand that all of his disciples change their personalities to walk with him and be like him. It wasn't, that wasn't his challenge. He was saying, hey, I'm going to challenge a lot about, but I'm not, Peter, actually, your impulse, your, your impulsiveness and just willingness to jump at things right now, it's a little chaotic, but I'm actually really going to use that to advance my church because you're going to have to be impulsive in Acts 2 when thousands of people show up wondering what's going on. I'm going to need you to be impulsive and preach a sermon and, and actually see countless people getting saved as a byproduct. So I'm actually going to use some of that personality if you would just trust me with it. And so, so many of us, what happens is, the devaluing of our personality sometimes can actually cause us to start to devalue such parts of who we are that maybe God actually put it there for a reason. You just got to figure out its proper use. The, the question is not, hey, all these things I got to cut off. It's what is the proper use for this? God, why, why did you make me a little bit more of a thinker, more of an intellectual, more of an introvert, right? Maybe I'm more, why did you make me that way? Why can't I just be more social? Why can't I just, and God's like, hey, I need you to see things that the big extroverts aren't seeing. Come on, extroverts miss a lot, okay? We don't miss, we miss a lot of details. I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, where are my extroverts at? Let me see them. Yeah, see, guys, we're thinning. There's less of us since COVID. I swear, COVID took a lot of us out. We got to stand strong, people, okay? Like, I'm serious. Everyone's like, oh, this is what staying home and not talking to anyone feels like? This is pretty good. <laughs> I like this. And so we lost some extroverts during COVID. But whether you're an extrovert, whether you're an introvert, whatever your, whatever your number is on the Enneagram, whatever your personality, do you, do you appreciate it? Do you see the value in it? Do you see the value add that you're going to bring to society to bring to a community of believers like this? Who you are really matters, but I think it's an important question. You think about temptation. Remember we talked about temptation not being identity. I think when we ask some questions about who we are, an important thought would be, does what I want, was does, does the desires that my personality has, maybe one of your desires is you're really bad at changing, and you're like, I don't want anything to change, and you know you're supposed to change something up. God's calling you to do something different, and you're like, I'm comfortable. Or maybe your personality is you're obsessed with change, and you love change, and you just are always changing, and you don't stay put. Whatever it is, do, do, does what I want determine who I am? So am I a change-obsessed or a change-resistant person? That's just one example. Or should who I am in Christ determine what I want? Remember that psalm we read last week? When I delight in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. Not all the things you desire today, he's going to make those happen for you. No, no, no. If you'll delight in him, he's going to change your desires. He's going to give you the correct desires according to how he made you. Because sometimes when we think like a human, when we think like the world, when we think in the mind of the flesh, we start to desire and try to build and want and go after things that we were never designed to carry. We weren't created that way. We weren't designed to have it. And so we have to ask that question ahead of time. Jesus, who am I in you? Who are you making me to be? And I'm going to allow that to determine desires and things that I'm going after and things I'm pursuing in my life. Church, our identity, our identity must be found more in what he did for us than what has been done to us or through us. So our identity found in Christ, it's about what he did. It's not about what they did to you. It's not about what you did. It's not about the mistakes. Our identity is safeguarded in Jesus Christ. And that's where the, we begin to lift off some of that shame. 
Galatians 2.20 gives us a great reminder that I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, we can't escape the reality of the flesh. I'm in this body. I'm in this life. This is the one I got. This is the life I'm, I'm living. I now, this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My identity is found in that. The 17th century philosopher and theologian Blaise Pascal put it this way. Hopefully we have the quote up this time. Uh, Not only do we know God by Jesus Christ alone, but we know ourselves only by Jesus Christ. We know life and death only through Jesus Christ. Apart from Jesus Christ, we do not know what is our life, nor our death, nor God, nor ourselves. Do you want to truly know yourself? It's who are you in Christ? Who are they in Christ? Who am I according to the gospel? Who am I according to how God made me? Who am I according to the calling of God that's on my life? My identity must be founded in that. It must be built on that. And anything less is a devaluing of yourself. It's accepting less than the absolute best for you. But it's a hard thing. Do I trust that God has the absolute best? best for me because we learned last week that sometimes God's best for me is some short-term pain, right, for what will come later a long-term pleasure. But the world offers short-term pleasure for long-term pain. And we live in this tension of, man, I just, I would love some short-term pleasure right now. I'd love to sell myself for cheaper than the price that was paid. I'd love to sell myself for less and settle for less rather than accept God's best. The other piece as we look at these verses, helps us understand what we do is a part of our identity. Not just what do you do nine to five. Please like de-Americanize this for just a second. Not 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 just not just your job, like the things that you do, because you are in the flesh. We, we can't escape it. We can't escape it. You've got your body, and it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What you do matters. But I'm telling you. What you do will have far less value if who you are is devalued. So if I devalue who I am in Christ, I'm going to put together a far less valuable work with my life. I'm going to actually do far less for the kingdom of God. I'm going to do far less than I'm going to put back into the world. I even love the fact, one of the things that I think is beautiful, and um, I think it's interesting how many, sometimes even Christians, don't, don't value tending and taking care of God's earth, right? Do you know that that was like the first job? It was a pre-fall condition to take care of God's creation. He's like, hey, I actually want you to tend to these gardens. I I want you to make things beautiful. I want you to work. If you hate work, I'm so sorry. It's never going away. (laughs) We will work in eternity. Work is a part of God's perfect creation. Why? Because God works. God works. God puts effort out. God exerts himself. God does things. He he makes things. He creates beautiful things. Ephesians 2.10 reminds us that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for work, for good works. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. We are created. Were we created by ourselves or were we created in Christ? Are you seeing a theme? We are made in Christ for good works. And for me? So this is another hard reality. The last hard reality was you're not your own. You don't belong to yourself. Here's the second reality. God has good works for you, and he prepared them for you. Do you believe in his plan? Come on, we're a bunch of adolescent teenagers who are like, Mom and Dad don't know what's best for me. You don't know what I'm capable of. I want to go to my own journey. I want to do my own life, right? We're all throwing fits. We're a bunch of teenagers throwing fits. Believing we know best. I got this figured out. If I, I, I know what's best for me. I know what's best for me. I got this figured out. But the reality is he's prepared things for us to do that we should walk in them. For me, I have found every time I stumble upon the steps that God has prepared in advance for me, they're glorious and amazing and so much better than I ever could have planned, hoped, dreamed, or imagined. And every time I think that I've got it figured out and I strive and try to determine my identity, through what I do, and I try to decide what I'm supposed to do, I labor in vain. It produces very little fruit. It produces very little good things in my life. So in pursuit of your identity, who knows what's best for you, you or God? 
I think it's interesting to think that someone else could know what's best for you. But if you've ever been in a healthy marriage, you know what this looks like. Renee and I are at this point. <laughs> we constantly go, no, no, I'm telling you what you need right now. <laughs> you, don't, you don't think that's what you need. I'm telling you right now, you need to go get some air. You're, you need to go shopping or you need to go get coffee or you need to go get food or, or you need to go to the woods, Sam. Go, go get in the woods. No, I'm telling you, you got to get. Have you ever had somebody know what's best for you and you're like, that's not what I need. You don't know me. And then you listen and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is exactly what I need. Why do you think you know what's best? Like, I consistently make wrong decisions. We don't know what's best for us. So I'd rather go say, hey, I'm, I was created in Christ. So, Christ, do you have an idea? You paid this extreme price for me. It's probably because you saw that I was worth something. I want to live up to that value. Can you show me how? What am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? Who am I supposed to talk to? What am I supposed to build with my life? What am I supposed to create? But then what we do is we devalue what we do by comparing it, contrasting it. But the reality is if you're going to be confident in your identity, you have to remember that what you do has value not in human terms, not in the way that we call value. Again, you're going, yeah, but what I'm creating, nobody wants to buy. What I'm producing, I mean, look at what they're doing. What they're doing is so much special. Why am I even bothering? Why am I even trying? I mean, they're doing it so much better than I ever could. Why even step into that? See, we compare as humans do. Remember the first verse? We don't think the way humans do. We're not thinking on that human level. We're actually thinking in Christ. And so we're going to view the work that we put out and the uh, keys can come on up as we close. So I wonder how much do you trust the creator? How much do you trust the potter? Did God mess up with you? Are you just a mistake? Because you wish you were better? Or you wish you were different? Or you were made to look different, feel different, sound different? Is your personality not good enough? Do you wish you were somebody else? That's a devaluing of God's creation. And church... When it comes to what we do, can I remind us, you aren't what you do, but how you do it showcases who you are. What you do is not your identity, it's not the fullness of your identity, but how you go about the things that you do in life really showcases, did I do it from a place of being founded in Christ, or am I striving by my strength? How we do it is everything. So I, I could work a terrible job, but how I do it showcases who I am and brings value to that thing, that place, that space. How we do it is everything. Because God works from the inside out, and let me tell you, what's happening on the inside will make its way out. So is it good things producing good things? Is it bad things producing bad things? Is it shame producing shame? Or is it freedom producing freedom? Is who you are so wrapped up in shame that it's even hard to see through it. And you're going, Pastor Sam, you keep saying the word value. And I just, I don't believe it. I mean, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at what I've done. Look at, come on, shame's got to be knocked off. We have to rid ourselves of this. Your value was determined before you did anything, before you breathed. It was set apart. You are set apart for special use. And if you don't feel very special, it's probably because you've not accepted your value and lived in that way. You see, when you devalue yourself, you invite insecurity in, you invite shame in, and sorry, when you live from that place, you're not going to produce much. But when you live like you don't belong to yourself anymore, when you live like God created you for something unique, when you trust the Creator, when you trust that he's got special work for you, that you're valuable, and you build your life from that place. Friend, you could produce phenomenal things with your life. You're never going to be held accountable to what the person next to you is holding, just what you're holding. Your value is not determined by other people's successes or failures. You're going to stand before Christ and he's going to hold you accountable for what you did with what he gave you. In church, he gave you enough, and you are enough. He gave you enough. 
And you are enough. So if shame is attached to who you are, I wonder if you've devalued yourself. Devalued the work of your life. The things you put your hands to. The effort that you've put forward. Maybe there's been a devaluing. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes all across this room? I want you just to have a moment, be honest. Have you allowed shame to pile up? Have you allowed shame to fall on your life? Is your identity wrapped up more in what's been done to you, what's been done through you? Or is your identity caught up in what he did for you? Church, you're doing so much better than you think you are. You're worth so much more than you think you are. He loves you more than you could ever imagine, hope, or dream. He's got a plan for you. He's got incredible things in store for you. But you got to lift off the shame for who you are. you got to start loving his beautiful creation. So with nobody looking around, if you feel like today's message was for you and you felt this shame attached to who you are, and you want me to pray for you, would you just slip up a hand? Just slip up a hand. You felt that. You felt that. You felt that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, all over the place. Hands all over. Hands all over. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. To Holy Spirit, I lift up every hand raised. Those that are feeling the crippling weight of shame that's actually attaching into the fabric of who they are. It's actually attaching to their identity. It's creating a crisis of self. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do what only you could do and remind them of their value right now. A value that was set by a price that was paid. And that all we have to do is submit. Allow you to be the chief cornerstone of our life. Build our life the way you designed us to. Listen to you. Follow your voice. Follow your word. God, I pray for those in the room that have been striving to try to figure out who they are on their own. God, I pray they would submit to you, that they would trust you as their creator, that they would trust you that you knew what you're doing. And that no one could take away their value. Shame be gone in Jesus' name. Be lifted off. In Jesus' name.